Fasting and prayer, what is it? What is this all about? Isaiah chapter 58, and we're going to read verses 1 through 9. It says, Shout it aloud and do not hold back. Raise your voice like a trumpet. Declare to my people their rebellion and the house of Jacob their sins. For day after day they seek me out and they seem eager to know my ways as if they were a nation that does what is right. It has not forsaken the commands of God. They ask me for just decisions and seem eager for God to come near them. Why have we fasted, they say, and you have not seen it? Why have we humbled ourselves and you have not noticed? Yet on the day of your fasting, you do as you please and you exploit your workers. Your fasting ends in quarrels and strife and striking each other with wicked fists. You cannot fast as you do today and expect your voice to be heard on high. This is the kind of fast that I have chosen. Only a day for a man to humble himself. It is only for bowing one's head like a reed and for lying in sackcloth and ashes. Is that what you call a fast, a day acceptable to the Lord? Is, it, is not this the kind of fasting I have chosen? To loosen the chains of injustice and to untie the cords of the yoke and to set the oppressed free and to break every yoke. Is it not to share your food with the hungry and to provide the poor wanderer with shelter? And when you see the naked, to clothe him and not to turn away from your own flesh and blood. When your light will break forth, then your light will break forth like the dawn and your healing will quickly appear. Then your righteousness will go before you and the glory of the Lord will be your rear guard. Verse 9, then you will call and the Lord will answer. You will cry for help and he will say, here I am. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we stand before you, God, broken, and God, knowing and understanding, Lord, that we can really only do, God, what you do through us. And so, God, we consecrate this time this morning, God, and this week this morning, God, for you to begin to flow through our lives, God, and to use us in a unique way, God, that you've never used us before. And God, we just ask this in Jesus' name, amen. Oh, thank you, sir. Blessings. Thank you. Thank you. Let me give you my personal definition of fasting. Fasting is withholding a portion of something from your life for the purpose of dedicating that same amount of time and effort to commune with God. Do you understand in the Bible, whenever the Bible talks about fasting and prayer, it seems like it always connects those two. And one of the things I want to set here as a precedent this morning is it really doesn't do us any good to fast and not pray. Fasting and not praying is just going on a diet, okay? And we're not going on a diet next week. We're fasting and praying. And so the whole concept of fasting is to take that same amount of time that you would normally spend and use that time to commune with God. If you're taking notes this morning, point number one, Fasting is all about prioritizing your life and getting back to the basics. Now, let me just tell you the way I'm going to fast. And I, I'm only telling you the way I do it just to let you know that this is one way of doing it, but I would encourage you to wrestle through your, and find your own way of doing it. I'm going to do what's called a Daniel fast, and if you want to uh, read up on that, it's in Daniel chapter 1. It's also mentioned again in Daniel chapter 10. And the way Daniel describes it is when he found himself in a tough situation and he needed a spiritual breakthrough, he began to fast and he said there was three things. Number one, no pleasant foods, which means no junk food. Number two, no meat. Number three, no wine. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to do vegetables. I'm going to do whole grains, nuts, probably a little bit of cottage cheese. But the point is what me and my wife really do during this week is we get back to eating what we call raw foods. And what I mean by raw food, foods is just something that you, that you don't either have to cook, bake, boil, or saute, or something that is not processed. You know, uh, the bottom line is, excuse me, if, we have to, if you can't pick it off a tree or dig it out of the ground, we don't eat it for the week. I remember talking to a friend of mine one time, and he, uh, he grew organic food. And uh, he even paid a rabbi one time. He told me $750 to come down and bless his plant anyway. But he grew, he grew organic food, no chemicals, no preservatives, blah, 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 blah. And he was telling me one time he was at a, at a trade show, and he was trying to, you know, promote his, his, his line of stuff that he sold. And uh, he said there was a, a friend of his there who also grew organic food. And this guy, you know what a hostess Twinkie is? He had had the same hostess Twinkie in the same wrapper at, 
brought it to one trade show to the next for 12 years. And that thing looked exactly like the day you pulled it out of the box. I mean, there was no decomposition, there was no mold, there was no rot, there was no decay. That thing was 100% pure chemicals. Makes you hungry for a hostess Twinkie, doesn't it? And we got a guy here this morning that makes real donuts. You don't make them like that, do you? <laughs> but take, a, take a small journey with me this morning. You know, th- th- I'll never forget the very first real week that me and my wife spent fasting and praying. Let me tell you what happened. One of the things that absolutely floored us was we began to realize that between the time we got in the car, went to the grocery store, loaded that thing in, drove the car home, loaded the groceries out of the car, back into the house, restocked the shelves, pull it back off the shelf, unpackage it, make it, set the table, eat, do the dishes, clean up the mess, take out the garbage. You know, do you realize how much of your life revolves around getting that next meal? It's really kind of ridiculous when you think about it, how much time your life really spends and how much time you really revolves around food. And see, the real issue here, the real issue here is how much time can I give in my life to any one thing? And why is this so important to me? You know, one of the things that if you read in the, in the, in the book of Exodus when the children of Israel came out of Egypt, one of the things that you see in there repeatedly over and over again was him complaining to Moses that when we were in Egypt, we had onions, we had leeks, garlics, melons, we had fish, we had everything that we needed. And God said, okay, you want meat from heaven? He rained whale quail on him, and the Bible says it came out of their nostrils. But here's the point, here's the point. You know what you eat is important to you. You know, I've often told people, I don't think I've made a very good missionary. I'm pretty pen, pen, uh, uh, finicky about the food I eat. But you know, it's one thing to be like that. It's another thing to allow that to hold you in bondage. You know, um, let me ask you this. If you took the same amount of time you spend every week eating food, preparing food, yeah, 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 and you spent that really digging in with God, really cultivating yourself intellectually, spiritually, and physically, you think you'd see a huge difference in your life? Spent the same amount of time? I had an old babysitter one time that we re- re- reconnected in our old age. Uh, not old age, but uh, she started going to the same church that I was going to there. And I had just a good time getting to know each other. And one night after church, we all went to this little local Dairy Queen kind of a thing. And we're all sitting there eating. And I, I said, you're not hungry? And she said, no, I'm kind of, she said, I'm on a chocolate fast. And I said, oh, I didn't know that you could fast chocolate. And I said, what, if you don't mind my asking, what's the issue? She said, it just became too important. And see, the real issue here isn't chocolate. The real issue is what is it that controls your life? You know, I had a guy that I used to work with. Man, he's gone now. He's in the sweet by and by. But he had a wife. First time I saw her, I was shocked. I was like, wow, what a woman. And he actually brought it up one day, the issue of what she looked like. And I said... I wasn't going to bring it up, but since you did, what, do you mind if I ask what the problem is? I mean, is this just a metabolism problem? Is that He said, no, everything's chocolate. Chocolate cake, chocolate pie, chocolate pudding, cho- everything is chocolate. See, the issue is not chocolate. The issue is what controls your life. You know, we, uh, we got a new pastor recently here in Section 4. I, don't, I won't say who it is because I'll let him tell the story if he ever gets a chance to. But we were at a, at a, me- a meeting the other day with a bunch of pastors and he said, can I share a little bit of my testimony? We said, sure, we'd love to hear your testimony, but I always love good testimonies. And uh, he said, I, I, I got saved. And he said, about two weeks later, he said, I walked outside one morning. Now, and I understand, we're not a condemning church here. I'm just telling you this story the way this brother told it, okay? He said, I pulled a smoke out and started going at it. And he said, you know, and God spoke to me just like that and said, you're going to quit smoking. And he said, why do I have to quit smoking, Lord? God asked him, he said, well, what do you do? What's the first thing you do when you get up in the morning? Okay, yeah. What's the first thing you do? What, 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 what do you do on break? When you get your first break of the day at work, what do you do? Okay. What do you do before you eat? Okay. What do you do after you eat? Okay. What do you do right before you go to bed? Okay. What do you do in the middle of the night when you wake up? Okay. What do you do when you're nervous, when you're anxious, and you're angry, and you're frustrated? What do you do? Okay. And God said, I want to become that thing in your life. Now, do you understand that those cigarettes in that man's life were 1% of the problem? They were 1% of the problem. The issue was what controls your life. 
Okay, one amen. Okay. How about this one? How about this one? You think, oh, he's preaching out against... No, let me... Th- th- I had a good friend of mine, another pastor, that when he got saved about the same time I did back in the early 1980s, the very first thing that God convicted him of was Star Wars. He had an entire room in his house that was basically a shrine to Star Wars. He said, I didn't know that Star Wars is a sin. Star Wars is not a sin. What God was, de- what God was dealing with in this man's life was not Star Wars, it was his obsession. You're going back to what Cameron was talking about here, going on the technology fast. You know, there's well-documented stories, and I really believe this internet addiction is going to be the next big problem, next big wave of problems in our American culture. And especially over in China and over in, uh, where was this one I was reading about? They said in, uh, oh, where was it at? South Korea, one in ten kids is totally addicted to the internet. They said in China, they said they've got, they've got they're kids that will literally fall out of their chair backwards and hit the ground from dehydration, just totally hypnotized by this crazy computer screen. And, uh, you know, as a pastor, I'm kind of a natural-born information miser. I love information. Give me some information. I love the Internet. I love my computer. Okay? But I've got to watch that thing. And even my wife knows how to jerk me in on that thing, honey. Earth to Dan, Earth to Dan. Okay. Interact with the kids. You know, I tell you something, you know, I, um, and I really believe this with all of my heart, I, 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 I'm afraid, I, I hope we're not raising a generation of young people that are more comfortable interacting with a machine than looking someone in the eyes. And uh, have you ever met someone that you can tell that they get their whole life through a, a television screen or the internet? Look me in the face and talk to me. I hope that's not becoming a lost art. And even this texting thing, I kind of had to get into it because I had to, because it's just the world we live in. But what I don't like about texting is it's just one more step in getting away from the way that God created us to interact with each other. It's just one more step removed. And I'm not saying texting is a sin. If you look at my phone, I've got a phone full of those crummy things. Uh, and, you know, and understandably, sometimes you don't have the time and the motivation to pick up somebody, and it's awkward to say hello and goodbye. It's just easier to say love you, bye, click. You know, that's, that's easy, you know. But there again, you know, should communication always be easy? And, and we keep trying to take the human element out of this, don't we? And is this part of the dumbing down of our spiritual lives and we don't even know it? And will we ever see a day when we've raised an entire generation of young people that don't even know how to look you in the face and communicate with you? See, text, excuse me, fasting is all about prioritizing your life and getting back to some basics. Point number two, point number two. You know, fasting is all about proper motives. You know, in verse three there, Isaiah asks a bit of a rhetorical question when he says, hey, God, I, or what they're saying, let's just read it here. He says, why have we fasted, they say, and you have not seen it? Why have we humbled ourselves and you have not noticed? You know what they're kind of saying there? They're saying, hey, God, I hope you really noticed I fasted last week. I'm sure you know very well the commands of our Lord Jesus when he said that only a hypocrite, only a hypocrite disfigures and walks around with a somber face when he's fasting so that he will be seen and appraised by men. But when you fast, wash your hair, anoint your head with oil, square your shoulders and smile at the world, and then when your father sees what you did in secret, then he will reward you. You know, I understand that, you know, I mean, we're announcing that we're having fasting and prayer. It's in the bullet, and we've talked about it. That's okay, but you don't use it as an opportunity to blow your trumpet, do you? You know, usually on, uh, well, I'm not even going to go there. Anyway. You know what's interesting here, though, is he says in verse 6, Isaiah gets right to the point, and he says, This is the kind of fasting that I have chosen to loosen the chains of injustice, to untie the cords of the oppressed, and to break every yoke. Do you know what God is saying there in that verse? He's saying the purpose of fasting is not to make you look spiritual. The purpose of fasting is to get you out of you. Let me say that again. The purpose of fasting is not to make you look spiritual. It's to get you out of you. That's what fasting is all about. And uh, let me put it, let me, how do I say this? Um, do you know what Isaiah is really saying there in that passage of Scripture? If you read verse 6 again, what he's really saying is that a real biblical fast is supposed to produce something functional in your life. 
There are some chains in your life that are supposed to be unloosed, and there are some cords that are supposed to be broken. There's some oppression that you're supposed to be set free from. And I would ask you this. If you're really going to get on board with us and do this, and I hope most of you do, I would ask you this. If I give you a three-by-five card and said, give me an answer, what would be that one functional thing that you want God to do in your life this week? Do you want a better marriage? Do you want a better job? Do you need a financial breakthrough? I don't know. So you need to be specific about that. I wouldn't come up and just show, show up here at church and just kind of float around and pray and say whatever. I would be specific about this and say, okay, God, I understand that you want to do something functional in my life this week. What is that one thing that you want me to do? Maybe it's reconciling with somebody you've had a misunderstanding with. I don't know. But I would be a little more specific than just, I'm going to show up and pray about whatever. Fasting is all about proper motives. Number three. You know, fasting is uh, not about twisting God's arm. You know, I, 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 I uh, have you ever done that seriously? I've, I have. If you haven't, I, I have done it for you. Um, you know, you remember the story in 2 Samuel chapter 12 where uh, David has this unfortunate bump of the road with a woman named Bathsheba? And the first thing he does, the first thing he does is he, uh, you know, he crosses his first sad line. He ends up with an adultery thing hanging over his head. And uh, then to cover that charge, he's got a, uh, that, to cover that sin, or the next thing he finds out is that she's pregnant. Okay, now he's got that issue hanging over his head. And then to try to cover both of those issues, he has the guy killed. He has her husband killed in battle, and now he's got a murder charge hanging over his head. You know, it's like he just doesn't know when to quit digging, right? And you remember what happens? The Bible says that in the course of time, the Lord was displeased with what David did and sent the prophet Nathan to confront him about this. And when Nathan comes to him and confronts him about this, David says, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan says to him, you will not die for your sin, but the child born to you will die. And the Bible says that for seven days, David laid on his own. He didn't even go to his own bed. He laid on the floor of his own house which would have been a, a stone-cold floor, literally. And he lays there, and he fasts, and he prays, and he weeps. And they even kind of encouraged him, come on, get up, go even, just go sleep in your own bed. And they, he said, no, I'm going to lay right here. And for seven days, this went on, and his personal attendant stood around him and just said, whatever, there was nothing they could do to reason with the guy. And the Bible says on the seventh day, David's laying there on his face, and he hears some of his servants over there whispering in the corner. He turns his head, and he says, is the child dead? They said he's gone. Right or wrong, this is what David did. The Bible says that David got up, and after he washed himself, he put on some clean clothes. He went and sat down at his table, and he ordered a meal to be served. Some of you would think that would be horribly uncharacteristic, wouldn't you? And his, his own attendants came to him, and they said, what, what, what is this whole issue here? While the, child, while the child was alive, you fasted and wept, and now that it's dead, you sit down and you just order a meal like it never happened? Do you remember what David's response was? Right or wrong, here was his exact words. He says, while the child was alive, I fasted and wept because I thought, who knows, maybe the Lord might be gracious and let the child live. But now that he's dead, why should I fast? And here's what's interesting to me about this story. When the prophet Nathan came to him, he looked at David and said, this child that was a product of this wrong relationship is going to die. It was prophesied this child would not live. David laid on the floor and writhed and, and writhed and prayed and fasted for seven days to try to change God's mind. Did it work? No. See, do you understand that we don't fast to try to change God's mind? We fast to try to figure out what's on his mind. Yeah, right? And let me throw something else at you, too. I, I actually see two dynamics at work here. I do believe that David was trying to change God's mind with this fasting and praying. You know what else I think he was doing, honestly? I think he was beating himself up for what he did. I would do that. I would beat myself up if I did that. Another little good, interesting point here. If you're going to fast this week to beat yourself up for a mistake that you made, you're doing it for all the wrong reasons. Okay? That's not a good reason to fast. And we don't fast to try to change God's mind. We fast to try to hear what is on his mind. The whole purpose is to get your flesh to shut down so your spirit can hear him. Right? Okay. Hmm. 
Number four. Number four. Fasting precedes spiritual breakthrough. You know, uh, I don't know how many of you know a young man by the name of Tim Eckert. We uh, sponsor him as a missionary on a monthly basis. This church does. He's in Indonesia right now. I want to read to you what he put on his Facebook page last Friday. He said, well, it's already Friday here in Indonesia, so I'm fasting and praying today for the Sishak people of Lombok. I once heard that there are six tribes that are considered the most difficult to reach in Indonesia, and he, he writes these out. I can't pronounce them. But he talks about uh, being in a missionary field conference in Lombok uh, about a year ago, and he says this is an island on the east of Bali, and it says it's just the whole thing is dominated by Islamic influence. And he says it's poor, and uh, they're trying to get the economy going again, et cetera, et cetera. But he talks about the fact that he's there, there's two other missionaries that are there, and a third person coming. And all he says is, join with me in prayer that God will open the doors for people that are locked in the bondage of a false religion. Thank God for a young man who understands that when you add fasting to your prayer, it's like kicking on a turbocharger. Thank God for a young man who's in Indonesia, and he's willing to get before the Lord and to make a sacrifice like that on a, a weekly or a monthly basis. But I will fast and pray for this nation, this God-forsaken nation that God has called me to reach. You know, if you remember in Mark chapter 9, there was a, a young boy who uh, had a, was literally demon-possessed. And you remember the whole story about this thing that we, it made him writhe and foam at the mouth. And Jesus comes up and says, Oh, unbelieving generation, bring the boy to me. And, and later on, when the disciples got Jesus alone back, kind of behind closed doors, they asked him, why couldn't we get this demon out of this young man? Remember his answer? This kind only comes out by fasting and prayer. There are certain strongholds in your life that will only be broken by fasting and prayer. By denying yourself of certain things that have become too important in your life and take that same amount of time and give it to God. Let me ask you this, are you willing to make that sacrifice this week? Now understand, too, I'm not telling you how to fast. I'm just asking you to fast something. And I'm asking you to take that same amount of time and to use that time going after God. Number five. You know fasting can bring supernatural protection to your life? You uh, remember a guy in the Bible by the name of Ezra? Ezra really was one of the unsung heroes of the faith. He had a quite a powerful walk with God, but we only have about 10 chapters that really record his life and what he did. But just to give you a little, a little it says that Ezra was a teacher well-versed in the law of Moses. It says the king granted him everything he asked for because the hand of the Lord was upon him. You know, I, I always love reading these little stories in the Bible about a God-fearing man that was able to win the heart of a heathen king. It tells you this guy really knew how to play his cards, right? Amen? Well, this story actually starts out with Ezra and... Uh, and a Persian king by the name of Artaxerxes, whose uh, throne was in the city of Babylon. And for mostly political reasons, this, this heathen king let a small group of Jews go back to Jerusalem and make kind of a sacred pillage to start rebuilding Solomon's temple. And having won the heart of this king, Ezra was obviously put in charge of the trip. And this was not some little two-day journey we're talking about here. At, at caravan speed, we're talking about a four-month trip here. Let me read to you a description of what it was like to travel in those days. It says, For a long time Israel was, Israel was without the true God. They were without a priest and without the law. And it says, In those days it was not safe to travel about, for all the inhabitants of the land were in great turmoil. What that verse is telling you there is that there was bushwhackers and there was bandits behind every rock. And there was no cell phones, there was no 9-11 to call. When you, when you left the safety of your village, you were totally on your own. But here's where the story takes an interesting twist. And this is Ezra in his own words. He says, I was ashamed to ask the king for soldiers and horsemen to protect us from enemies on the road because we had just told the king that the gracious hand of our God was upon everyone who looks to him. You know what he was saying there? What he was saying there was we just got done bragging to this heathen king about how wonderful and how powerful our God was. I didn't really have the audacity to ask for military protection on this trip. So you know what Ezra does? This is what he does. Therefore I proclaimed a fast, 
so that we might humble ourselves before our God and to ask him for a safe journey for us and for our children and for all of our possessions. So we fasted and we petitioned our God about this, and he answered our prayers. What Ezra was saying is I felt like it would have been a compromise to have asked for a bunch of bodyguards after I just got done telling this king what a gracious and powerful God that I serve. And we know from the end of the story that his journey was safe. Do you really believe that fasting can bring supernatural protection into your life? You know, I remember reading a true story one time about a pastor over in Nigeria. And uh, they showed up a bunch of Islamic extremists, and there was a lot of tension there between the Christians and the Muslims. And some Muslims showed up one day at his house, and he wasn't there, but his wife did, so was there, and so they kind of had their way with her. She spent the whole next year in recovery, and nightmare of nightmares, literally one year to the day, they showed up back at this guy's house again. His name was Pastor Benjamin. They found him and drug him outside the house, and as they threw him over on the ground, they pulled out their machetes and their clubs, and they drew back, ready to just kill the guy, literally. He put his hand up. He made a motion. Can I just have one, one moment to pray? And as he knelt down in the dirt to pray, he lifted his hands toward heaven, and he felt another hand grab his. It was the hand of his wife. She'd walked out of the house, walked right through the group. He continued to pray, and about a minute later, he felt another hand. He looked over. It was his teenage son. The father looked at the son and said, this really isn't your fight. Go back in the house. And the son said to the father, they've all left. And you know, I, I, I can't prove this. I can't prove this. I wasn't there. But you remember that story in the Bible where Elijah said, Lord, open the young man's eyes and show him that what we have fighting for us today are more than those who are against us. And the Bible says that the Lord opened that young man's eyes and the hills were lined with chariots and horses of fire. And do you believe, do you believe that God can open someone's eyes and let them see that if you touch my anointed... You're going to get it. Just walk away. Do you really believe that God can bring supernatural protection to a man's life? Yeah, I do believe that. It's happened in the Bible many, many times, and it's happened in, 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 through, the, through, the, through the lesson of church history. It's happened many, many times. You ever heard the story of Benjamin Franklin? Remember that story? And the first time he actually got to talk to the American Indians, and they said, we knew for a fact that your God was more powerful than our God. And he said, how's that? He said, because every time we shot you, the bullets bounced off you. You don't hear about that in the secular media, do you? Does fasting and prayer bring supernatural protection to a man's life? Yes, it does. I'm going to close with this. Do you believe that fasting can bring supernatural protection to a nation? You know, I, I know it's easy to sit here and say, I, I'm, I'm, I'm an American. I have nothing to worry about. Oh, I'll tell you something, folks. History is full of great nations that sat back and folded their arms and said, we have nothing to worry about. And the next thing you know, they were clinging for their life. I got a, I got a little letter I want to read you here. This is uh, from February 28, 1795. This is a proclamation that was issued by the governor of Massachusetts. His name was Samuel Adams. And he says, uh, the, the caption, the heading on this, this poster they put up, it said, for a day of public fasting, humiliation, and prayer. And he writes like this. He says, the supreme ruler of the universe, having been pleased in the course of his providence to establish the independence of the United States of America and to cause them to assume their rank, amount the nations of the earth and bless them with liberty, peace, and plenty. We ought to be led by religious feelings of gratitude and walk before him in all humility according to his most holy law. But as the depravity of our hearts has in so many instances drawn us aside from the path of duty so that we have frequently offended our divine and merciful benefactor, it is therefore highly incumbent upon us according to the ancient and laudable practice of our pious ancestors to open the year by a public solemn fast. That with true repentance and contrition of heart we may unitedly implore the forgiveness of our sins through the merits of Jesus Christ and humbly supplicate our Heavenly Father to grant us the aids of his grace for the amendment of our hearts and lives and his smiles upon our temple concerns. 
I have therefore thought fit to appoint Thursday, the second day of April, to be observed as a day of public fasting, humiliation, and prayer throughout this commonwealth, calling upon the ministers of the gospel of every denomination with their respective congregations to assemble on that day and devoutly implore the divine forgiveness of our sins, to pray that the light of the gospel and the rights of conscience might be continued to the people of the United States of America, and that his holy word may be improved by them so that the name of God may be exalted and their own liberty and happiness secured. When is the last time you heard a politician talk like that? Huh. You know, I'm going to close with this one last thought here. You know, one of the things that I'm always reminded of when I fast, excuse me, is, um, you know, in the middle of a fast, you know, I start to crave things I don't normally desire. You know, I, I, I like a lot of kinds of food. There's a lot of kinds of food I don't like. And I have found that in the middle of a fast, I even start to crave things that I normally wouldn't even like. Do you think maybe one of the reasons that God calls us to fast every once in a while is because there are things that we should be craving that we're no longer craving? And it's only in the middle of a fast that all of a sudden that that craving is reignited on the inside of us and we realize, hey, that sounds really good right now. Don't ever assume that everything that you should have in your life you're automatically craving right now. Sometimes it's in the middle of extreme hunger that you start to crave things you've completely forgot about. And I really believe that there's things in my life that I should be craving that quite honestly I've just forgot about them. But hopefully by the end of this week, That'll be reignited again. Let's all bow our hearts before the Lord. Nick, if you could start some music here. Lord Jesus, we come before you right now, dear God, and we, uh, God, we acknowledge our need of you, Lord. And God, we acknowledge our need of you in this nation, Lord, even though a lot of us don't see it. God, we know that there's things, God, in our spiritual diet, God, that we should be craving, Lord, that we've long forgotten about. And God, we do pray, Lord Jesus, that you would reignite those cravings on the inside of us, God, and we would begin to crave things, Lord, that we haven't thought about maybe for years. And Lord, I know there's people here this morning, Lord, that they came this morning, God, because they need a spiritual breakthrough in their lives. For some, Lord, it's, it's financial, God. For some, it's relationships, God. For some, it's just their walk with you. And God, I pray right now, Lord Jesus, that your Holy Spirit, God, would go forth, Lord, and it would begin to deal with each individual, Lord, situation, God, like only you can. You know, I can't preach a message on fasting and prayer without giving people an opportunity to pray. I'd like to have our prayer team come up here right now and just stand in front of the church.